section fourteen of mob rule in new orleans by ida b wells barnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen section fourteen died in self-defense the life character and death of robert charles challenges the thoughtful consideration of all fair-minded people in the frenzy of the moment when nearly a dozen men lay dead the victims of his unerring and death-dealing aim it was natural for a prejudiced press and for citizens in private life to denounce him as a desperado and a murderer but sea depths are not measured when the ocean rages nor can absolute justice be determined while public opinion is lashed into fury there must be calmness to ensure correctness of judgment the fury of the hour must abate before we can deal justly with any man or any cause that charles was not a desperado is amply shown by the discussion in the preceding chapter the darkest pictures which the reporters could paint of charles were quoted freely so that the public might find upon what grounds the press declared him to be a lawbreaker unquestionably the grounds are wholly insufficient not a line of evidence has been presented to prove that charles was the fiend which the first reports of the new orleans charge him to be nothing more should be required to establish his good reputation for the rule is universal that a reputation must be assumed to be good until it is proved bad but that rule does not apply to the negro for as soon as he is suspected the public judgment immediately determines that he is guilty of whatever crime he stands charged for this reason as a matter of duty to the race and the simple justice to the memory of charles an investigation has been made of the life and character of charles before the fatal affray which led to his death robert charles was not an educated man he was a student who faithfully investigated all the phases of oppression from which his race has suffered that he was a student is amply shown by the times democrat report of the twenty fifth which says well-worn text-books bearing his name written in his own scrawling handwriting and well-filled copy-books found in his trunk showed that he had burned the midnight oil and desired to improve himself intellectually in order that he might conquer the hated white race from this quotation it will be seen that he spent the hours after days of hard toil in trying to improve himself both in the study of text-books and in writing he knew that he was a student of a problem which required all the intelligence that a man could command and he was burning his midnight oil gathering knowledge that he might better be able to come to an intelligent solution to his aid in the study of this problem he sought the aid of a christian newspaper the voice of missions the organ of the african methodist episcopal church he was in communication with its editor who is a bishop and is known all over this country as a man of learning a lover of justice and the defender of law and order charles could receive from bishop turner not a word of encouragement to be other than an earnest tireless and god-fearing student of the complex problems which affected the race for further help and assistance in his studies charles turned to an organization which has existed and flourished for many years at all times managed by men of high christian standing and absolute integrity these men believe and preach a doctrine that the best interests of the negro will be subserved by an emigration from america back to the fatherland and they do all they can to spread the doctrine of emigration and to give material assistance to those who desire to leave america and make their future homes in africa this organization is known as the international migration society it has its headquarters in birmingham alabama from this place it issues pamphlets some of which were found in the home of robert charles and which pamphlets the reporters of the new orleans papers declare to be incendiary and dangerous in their doctrine and teaching nothing could be further from the truth copies of any and all of them may be secured by writing to d j flummer who is president and in charge of the home office in birmingham alabama three of the pamphlets found in charles's room are named respectively 
first prospectus of the liberian colonization society which pamphlet in a few brief pages tells of the work of the society plans prices and terms of transportation of colored people who choose to go to africa these pages are followed by a short conservative discussion of the negro question and close with an argument that africa furnishes the best asylum for the oppressed negroes in this country the second pamphlet is entitled christian civilization of africa this is a brief statement of the advantages of the republic of liberia and an argument in support of the superior conditions which colored people may attain to by leaving the south and settling in liberia the third pamphlet is entitled the negro and liberia this is a larger document than the other two and treats more exhaustively the question of emigration but from the first page to the last there is not an incendiary line or sentence there is not even a suggestion of violence in all of its thirty-two pages and not a word which could not be preached from every pulpit in the land if it is true that the workman is known by his tools certainly no harm could ever come from the doctrines which were preached by charles or the papers and pamphlets distributed by him nothing ever written in the voice of missions and nothing ever published in the pamphlets above alluded to in the remotest way suggest that a peaceable man should turn lawbreaker or that any man should dye his hands in his brother's blood in order to secure as far as possible positive information about the life and character of robert charles it was plain that the best course to pursue was to communicate with those with whom he had sustained business relations accordingly a letter was forwarded to mr d j flummer who is president of the colonization society in which letter he was asked to state in reply what information he had of the life and character of robert charles the result was a very prompt letter in response the text of which is as follows birmingham alabama august twenty first nineteen hundred mrs ida b wells barnett chicago illinois dear madam replying to your favor of recent date requesting me to write you giving such information as i may have concerning the life habits and character of robert charles who recently shot and killed police officers in new orleans i wish to say that my knowledge of him is only such as i have gained from his business connection with the international migration society during the past five or six years during which time i was president of the society he having learned that the purpose of this society was to colonize the colored people in liberia west africa and thereby lessen or destroy the friction and prejudice existing in this country between the two races set about earnestly and faithfully distributing the literature that we issued from time to time he always appeared to be mild but earnest in his advocacy of emigration and never to my knowledge used any method or means that would in the least appear unreasonable and had always kept within the bounds of law and order in advocating emigration the work he performed for this society was all gratuitous and apparently prompted from his love of humanity and desires to be instrumental in building up a negro nationality in africa if he ever violated a law before the killing of the policeman i do not know of it yours very truly d j flummer besides this statement mr flummer enclosed a letter received by the society two days before the tragedy at new orleans this letter was written by robert charles and it attests his devotion to the cause of emigration which he had espoused memoranda on the margin of the letter show that the order was filled by mailing the pamphlets it is very probable that these were the identical pamphlets which were found by the mob which broke into the room of robert charles and seized upon these harmless documents and declared they were sufficient evidence to prove charles a desperado in the light of subsequent events the letter of charles which follows sounds like a voice from the tomb new orleans july thirtieth nineteen hundred mr d j flummer dear sir i received your last pamphlets and they are all given out 
i want you to send me some more and i enclose you the stamps i think i will go over in greenville mississippi and give my people some pamphlets over there yours truly robert charles the latest word of information comes from new orleans from a man who knew charles intimately for six years for obvious reasons his name is withheld in answer to a letter sent him he answers as follows birmingham alabama august twenty third nineteen hundred mrs ida b wells barnett dear madam it affords me great pleasure to inform you as far as i know of robert charles i have been acquainted with him about six years in this city he never has as i know given any trouble to any one he was quiet and a peaceful man and was very frank in speaking he was too much of a hero to die few can be found to equal him i am very sorry to say that i do not know anything of his birthplace nor his parents but enclosed find letter from his uncle from which you may find more information you will also find one of the circulars in which charles was in possession of which was styled as a crazy document let me say until our preachers preach this document we will always be slaves if you can help circulate this crazy doctrine i would be glad to have you do so for i shall never rest until i get to that heaven on earth that is the west coast of africa in liberia with best wishes to you i still remain as always for the good of the race signed blank by only those whose anger and vindictiveness warp their judgment is robert charles a desperado their word is not supported by the statement of a single fact which justifies their judgment and no criminal record shows that he was ever indicted for any offence much less convicted of crime on the contrary his work for many years had been with christian people circulating emigration pamphlets and active as agent for a mission publication men who knew him say he was a law-abiding quiet industrious peaceable man so he lived so he lived and so he would have died had not he raised his hand to resent unprovoked assault and unlawful arrest that fateful monday night that made him an outlaw and being a man of courage he decided to die with his face to the foe the white people of this country may charge that he was a desperado but to the people of his own race robert charles will always be regarded as the hero of new orleans end of section fourteen recording by holly jensen section fifteen of mob rule in new orleans by ida b wells barnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen section fifteen burning human beings alive not only has life been taken by mobs in the past twenty years but the ordinary procedure of hanging and shooting have been improved upon during the past ten years fifteen human beings have been burned to death in the different parts of the country by mobs men women and children have gone to see the sight and all have approved the barbarous deeds done in the high light of the civilization and christianity of this country in eighteen ninety one ed coy was burned to death in texarkana arkansas he was charged with assaulting a white woman and after the mob had securely tied him to a tree the men and boys amused themselves for some time sticking knives into coy's body and slicing off pieces of flesh when they had amused themselves sufficiently they poured coal oil over him and the women in the case set fire to him it is said that fifteen thousand people stood by and saw him burned this was on a sunday night and press reports told how the people looked on while the negro burned to death february first eighteen ninety three henry smith was burned to death in paris texas the entire county joined in that exhibition the district attorney himself went for the prisoner and turned him over to the mob 
he was placed upon a float and drawn by four white horses through the principal streets of the city men women and children stood at their doors and waved their handkerchiefs and cheered the echoes they knew that the man was to be burned to death because the newspaper had declared for three days previous that this would be so excursions were run by all the railroads and the mayor of the town gave the children a holiday so that they might see the sight henry smith was charged with having assaulted and murdered a little white girl he was an imbecile and while he had killed the child there was no proof that he had criminally assaulted her he was tied to a stake on a platform which had been built ten feet high so that everybody might see the sight the father and brother and uncle of the little white girl that had been murdered was upon that platform about fifty minutes entertaining the crowd of ten thousand persons by burning the victim's flesh with red-hot irons their own newspapers told how they burned his eyes out and ran the red-hot iron down his throat cooking his tongue and how the crowd cheered wild delight at last having declared themselves satisfied coal oil was poured over him and he was burned to death and the mob fought over the ashes for bones and pieces of his clothes july seventh eighteen ninety three in bardwell kentucky c j miller was burned to ashes since his death this man has been found to be absolutely innocent of the murder of the two white girls with which he was charged but the mob would wait for no justification they insisted that as they were not sure he was the right man they would compromise the matter by hanging him instead of burning not to be outdone they took the body down and made a huge bonfire out of it july twenty second eighteen ninety three at memphis tennessee the body of lee walker was dragged through the street and burned before the courthouse walker had frightened some girls in a wagon along a country road by asking them to let him ride in their wagon they cried out some men working in a field nearby said it was an attempt of assault and of course began to look for their prey there was never any charge of rape the women only declared that he attempted an assault after he was apprehended and put in jail and perfectly helpless the mob dragged him out shot him cut him beat him with sticks built a fire and burned the legs off then took the trunk of the body down and dragged further up the street and at last burned it before the courthouse september twentieth eighteen ninety three at roanoke virginia the body of a negro who had quarrelled with a white woman was burned in the presence of several thousand persons these people also wreaked their vengeance upon this helpless victim of the mob's wrath by sticking knives into him kicking him and beating him with stones and otherwise mutilating him before life was extinct june eleventh eighteen ninety eight at knoxville arkansas james perry was shut up in a cabin because he had smallpox and burned to death he had been quarantined in this cabin when it was declared that he had this disease and the doctor sent for when the physician arrived he found only a few smouldering embers upon inquiry some railroad hands who were working nearby revealed the fact that they had fastened the door of the cabin and set fire to the cabin and burned man and hut together february twenty second eighteen ninety eight at lake city south carolina postmaster baker and his infant child were burned to death by a mob that had set fire to his house mr baker's crime was that he had refused to give up the post office to which he had been appointed by the national government the mob had tried to drive him away by persecution and intimidation finding that all else had failed they went to his home in the dead of night and set fire to his house and as the family rushed forth they were greeted by a volley of bullets the father and his baby were shot through the open door and wounded so badly that they fell back in the fire and were burned to death the remainder of the family consisting of the wife and five children escaped with their lives from the burning house but all of them were shot one of the number made a cripple for life 
january seventh eighteen ninety eight two indians were tied to a tree at maud post office indian territory and burned to death by a white mob they were charged with murdering a white woman there was no proof of their guilt except the unsupported word of the mob yet they were tied to a tree and slowly roasted to death their names were lewis mcgeezy and hond martin since that time these boys have been found to be absolutely innocent of the charge of course that discovery is too late to be of any benefit to them but because they were indians the indian commissioner demanded and received from the united states government an indemnity of thirteen thousand dollars april twenty third eighteen ninety nine at palmetto georgia sam hose was burned alive in the presence of a throng on sunday afternoon he was charged with killing a man named cranford his employer which he admitted he did because his employer was about to shoot him to the fact of killing the employer was added the absolutely false charge that hose assaulted the wife hose was arrested and no trial was given him according to the code of reasoning of the mob none was needed a white man had been killed and a white woman was said to have been assaulted that was enough when hose was found he had to die the atlanta constitution in speaking of the murder of cranford said that the negro who was suspected would be burned alive not only this but it offered five hundred dollars reward for his capture after he had been apprehended it was publicly announced that he would be burned alive excursion trains were run and bulletins were put up in the small towns the governor of georgia was in atlanta while excursion trains were being made up to take visitors to the burning many fair ladies drove out in their carriages on sunday afternoon to witness the torture and burning of a human being hose's ears were cut off then his toes and fingers and passed round to the crowd his eyes were put out his tongue torn out and flesh cut in strips by knives finally they poured coal oil on him and burned him to death they dragged his half-consumed trunk out of the flames cut it open extracted his heart and liver and sold slices for ten cents each for souvenirs all of which was published most promptly in the daily papers of georgia and boasted over by the people of that section october nineteenth eighteen eighty nine at canton mississippi joseph lafleur was burned to death a house had been entered and its occupants murdered during the absence of the husband and father when the discovery was made it was immediately supposed that the crime was the work of a negro and the motive that of assaulting white women bloodhounds were procured and they made a round of the village and discovered only one colored man absent from his home this was taken to be proof sufficient that he was the perpetrator of the deed when he returned home he was apprehended taken into the yard of the house that had been burned down tied to a stake and was slowly roasted to death december sixth eighteen ninety nine at maysville kentucky william coleman also was burned to death he was slowly roasted first one foot and then the other and dragged out of the fire so that the torture might be prolonged all of this without a shadow of proof or scintilla of evidence that the man had committed the crime thus have the mobs of this country taken the lives of their victims within the past ten years in every single instance except one these burnings were witnessed by from two thousand to fifteen thousand people and no one person in all these crowds throughout the country had the courage to raise his voice and speak out against the awful barbarism of burning human beings to death men and women of america are you proud of this record which the anglo-saxon race has made for itself your silence seems to say that you are your silence encourages a continuance of this sort of horror only by earnest active united endeavor to arouse public sentiment can we hope to put a stop to these demonstrations of american barbarism end of section fifteen
Recording by Holly Jensen. Section 16 of Mob Rule in New Orleans by Ida B. Wells Barnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Section 16 Lynching Record. The following table of lynchings has been kept year by year by the Chicago Tribune, beginning with 1882, and shows the list of Negroes that have been lynched during that time. 1882 negroes murdered by mobs 52 1883 negroes murdered by mobs 39 1884 negroes murdered by mobs 53 1885 negroes murdered by mobs 164 1886 negroes murdered by mobs 136 1887 negroes murdered by mobs 128 1888 negroes murdered by mobs 143 1889 negroes murdered by mobs 127 1890 negroes murdered by mobs 171 1891 negroes murdered by mobs 192 1892 negroes murdered by mobs 241 1893 negroes murdered by mobs 200 1894 negroes murdered by mobs 190 1895 negroes murdered by mobs 171 1896 negroes murdered by mobs 131 1897 negroes murdered by mobs 156 1898 negroes murdered by mobs 127 1899 negroes murdered by mobs 107 of these thousands of men and women who have been put to death without judge or jury less than one-third of them have even been accused of criminal assault the world at large has accepted unquestionably the statement that negroes are lynched only for assaults upon white women of those who were lynched from eighteen eighty two to eighteen ninety one the first ten years of the tabulated lynching record the charges are as follows two hundred and sixty nine were charged with rape two hundred fifty three with murder forty four with robbery thirty seven with incendiarism four with burglary twenty seven with race prejudice thirteen quarrelled with white men ten with making threats seven with rioting five with miscegenation in thirty-two cases no reasons were given the victims were lynched on general principles during the past five years the record is as follows of the one hundred seventy one persons lynched in eighteen ninety five only thirty four were charged with this crime in eighteen ninety six out of a hundred thirty one persons who were lynched only thirty four were said to have assaulted women of the one hundred fifty six in eighteen ninety seven only thirty two in eighteen ninety eight out of a hundred twenty seven persons lynched twenty four were charged with the alleged usual crime in 1899 of the 107 lynchings 16 were said to be for crimes against women these figures of course speak for themselves and to the unprejudiced fair-minded person it is only necessary to read and study them in order to show that the charge that the negro is a moral outlaw is a false one made for the purpose of injuring the negro's good name and to create public sentiment against him if public sentiment were alive as it should be upon the subject it would refuse to be longer hoodwinked and the voice of conscience would refuse to be stilled by these false statements if the laws of the country were obeyed and respected by the white men of the country who charge that the negro has no respect for law these things could not be for every individual no matter what the charge would have a fair trial and an opportunity to prove his guilt or innocence before a tribunal of law 
that is all the negro asks that is all the friends of law and order need to ask for once the law of the land is supreme no individual who commits crime will escape punishment individual negroes commit crimes the same as do white men but that the negro race is peculiarly given to assault upon women is a falsehood of the deepest dye the tables given above show that the negro who is saucy to white men is lynched as well as the negro who is charged with assault upon women less than one-sixth of the lynchings last year eighteen ninety nine were charged with rape the negro points to his record during the war in rebuttal of this false slander when the white women and children of the south had no protector save only these negroes not one instance is known where the trust was betrayed it is remarkably strange that the negro had more respect for womanhood with the white men of the south hundreds of miles away than they have to-day when surrounded by those who take their lives with impunity and burn and torture even worse than the unspeakable turk again the white women of the north came south years ago threaded the forests visited the cabins taught the schools and associated only with the negroes whom they came to teach and had no protectors near at hand they had no charge or complaint to make of the danger to themselves after association with this class of human beings not once has the country been shocked by such recitals from them as come from the women who are surrounded by their husbands brothers lovers and friends if the negro's nature is bestial it certainly should have proved itself in one of these two instances the negro asks only justice and an impartial consideration of these facts end of section sixteen recording by holly jensen End of Mob Rule in New Orleans by Ida B. Wells Barnett